forests right by the sea. Poland has a lot to offer what other countries no longer have. Also feats of technology that have been working perfectly for 150 years. The people are friendly and sometimes a little chaotic, but they can turn their hands to almost anything. Whether it's distilling schnapps or diving to wrecks, and even agile 79-year-olds are out and about with their DIY constructions. The journey begins at Poland's border to Russia. It takes us across Erblon to Gdansk, then on to Hill Peninsula and ends in the Hanseatic city, Czechin. The Vistula Lagoon, a 70 kilometer long strip of sand from the Kaliningrad region to the fortified city of Frombok at the mouth of the Vistula. Over 500 years ago, Nicolaus Copernicus, who discovered that the Earth orbits the Sun, used to work here. We don't know how much of his enlightenment he received at this cathedral school, but his name can be found in every school book until this day, and he is buried in Frombok Cathedral. After a journey of more than a thousand kilometers, the Vistula flows into the Baltic Sea at this lagoon. On this side of the Baltic Sea, the conditions are perfect for worshippers of the wind. Karolina Vinkowska has outdone her competitors in the windiest regions of the world, but she still prefers to chase the wind in her homeland. Karolina is vice world champion in the freestyle competition. And at a wind force of six, her fun at sea is only beginning. Kite surfing was first practiced in Poland in 2000. Back then I was still a little girl and very curious. I tried it and was hooked immediately. I love this sport. It is very easy for beginners. And since I wasn't very strong, I liked kite surfing a lot because you didn't have to grapple with all the windsurfing equipment. Only the fearless can pull off the best tricks when kite surfing. The world's best kite surfers jump 10 meters high and up to 250 meters far. Life without the sea is simply unimaginable to Carolina. When Poland's kite season ends in September, she travels the world in search of the best wind conditions. The most important thing, though, is the warmth. In other words, the summer and the wind. Just like the earth turns, we kite surfers move from place to place. So, in January and February, when it's winter in Poland, I fly to South Africa, to Cape Town. It's summer there then. I follow the summer and the wind all over the world. Across the Vistula Lagoon and along the Russian border, the journey takes us into the heart of the country. In the Missourian forests, it is hard to imagine today that this is where, in 1944, the Second World War almost took a very different path. In the Führer's headquarters, Wolf's Lair, Klaus Schenk Lord von Stauffenberg attempted to assassinate German dictator Adolf Hitler. Poland is known the world over for its horses, both bred and wild ones. These young conic stallions are fighting over the leadership of the herd.
But these animals are an even greater national icon. Every fourth stalk in the world is a pole. The village Shivkovo has only nine houses, but over 50 storks' nests. The proud storks tend to ignore the presence of humans. For lack of a distinctive voice, they communicate through the medium of beak rattling. Storks are such graceful birds. They look particularly nice in the evening sun. When you look up at a stork, they seem very majestic. Storks certainly don't have to dread the comparison with other birds of prey, like the eagle. Piotr Iczko is an obliging host. The ornithologist builds new nests for the birds each year. After all, they are supposed to come back again. The stork season starts in March and lasts until August. It is very impressive. It begins with the battle for nests in the spring. The couples take turns brooding the eggs. Before the offspring leaves the nest, you can witness amazing scenes where they fight over the food that their parents bring them. Conics and cows keep the meadows around the village well trimmed, much to the stork's benefit. For when the grass is too high, the storks can't find their prey. In Shivkovo, the storks can enjoy a fine spread. They can be seen striding across the meadows and swamplands, searching for worms, frogs and mice. Storks are omnivores. If they discover prey, they strike immediately. The young birds have to start catching their own food very early. They start learning to fly after only 40 days. After 60 days, they have to leave the nest and feed themselves. Piotr runs a large farm. In summer, he is on the go almost around the clock. Not only his cattle and horses, but also his feathered guests up on the roof need to be fed. I have to climb up onto the roof now and again to do little repairs to the nests. I help the storks with their nest building by putting up a platform for them as a solid base. That makes it easier for the storks. As soon as the young ones try to start flying, Piotr fixes the nests for the next season. One of them may weigh up to one ton. To teach their offspring how to fly, the storks use a cunning method. First they fatten the young ones up so they grow quickly. Just before the first flying lessons, they let them starve so that they can leave the nest more easily. The fire department helps Piotr repair the nests. Without their long ladder, it would be too dangerous to lay the nest material on the new barn. For safety reasons, there must always be two people doing the risky work on the roof. For the firemen, it's an honor to help Piotr. Each summer they rescue a few injured storks that crash landed in trees during their first attempts at flying. Today is probably the last operation of the year. Most of the storks have already left on their long journey to Africa. I admire them for being so brave and for flying thousands of kilometers just to spend the winter in the south. But it's definitely warmer for them in the south. I certainly don't envy them when I think about how much they have to endure on the trip. Soon Piotr will be alone again. Until next spring, 
when his storks faithfully find their way back to their birthplace. From Shifkavu, the journey continues to El Plong. For centuries, this used to be settlers' land. Farmers were recruited from the Baltic states and made themselves at home here. During the Middle Ages, the Teutonic Order missionized the people here. At the end of the Second World War, the Germans were driven out and their settlements were destroyed during combats with the Red Army. The Elblong Ostrada Canal was left unscathed by the war. It connects Ostrada and Elblong over a stretch of 82 kilometers. It is not the length though that is remarkable, but the height difference that must be overcome along the way. Over 10 kilometers, the boats must overcome a height difference of 100 meters. For this purpose, they are pulled by ropes out of the water at five such ramps and are transported over land with carriages that run on rails to the next higher water level. Eva Stanchik is lockkeeper at the ramp Olishnitsa. This place has a very special meaning for all of us. My father and even my grandfather already lived here. I was not only born here, I also grew up here. My husband moved here as well because he works with us. And so our daughter was born here too. Eva and her husband chair the shifts at Olishnitsa. In the morning, most boats sail down the canal from El Blanc and return in the afternoon. The canal was built in order to connect El Blanc and Ostroda. It served as a transportation route for grain and also wood. It's the connection between Mazuria and the Baltic Sea. Eva waits until the boat is on the carriage before giving her husband the signal. He sets the towing ropes in motion. The machinery from the industrial age runs on water power and seems to be indestructible. The Elplong Ostrada Canal has always connected the economically retarded hinterland with the coast. Today, it leads foreigners into the heart of the country. It has landmark status. I like it when the tourists say hello. It fascinates me that people are so different. Some kid around and tell jokes. Many smile and are in a good mood because they're enjoying their holidays. According to Eva, in 150 years, not a single part had to be replaced. She hopes that it will stay that way for a long time. I think this region is becoming more and more important for tourism. I worry about the old ramps and if they're up to the rush. From Elplong, the route continues to Gdansk. On the way, we pass the Vistula Bridge, Chef. It is cleaned and renovated with a sandblaster. The bridge that was built in 1857 once connected Berlin with Königsberg, 
as part of the Prussian East Railroad. During the Second World War, Gdansk was destroyed. Afterwards, the city was rebuilt based on old engravings, photos and paintings. Towers made of brick like those of St. Mary's Church, magnificent patrician houses and the waterside promenade let the Hanseatic city shine in new splendour. A city that was once called the Queen of the Baltic Sea. The City Hall, the court of Arthur and Neptune's Fountain, hark back to the city's former trading days. On the 1st of September 1939, this hill moved into the spotlight of world history, the Westerplatte. The German warship Schleswig-Holstein fired at Polish positions. The first day of the war, Today, a memorial bears memory to the Battle of Westerplatte and to the fallen troops in the Second World War. The many wrecks in the Gulf of Gdansk are also tragic reminders of this war. The Wicher was a Polish destroyer. It was sunk by German planes only two days after the first gunshots on Westerplatte. Lech Nowicz was only a child at the time. Today he's 79 years old, Poland's oldest wreck diver. Already as a child, diving images from England fascinated him so much that he made his first pair of diving goggles out of an old lunchbox. Normal diving clubs weren't able to get any diving equipment. It was only available to the army and state-owned firms. So we had to make our own gear. I still have the equipment I made myself. We used to go diving with these things in the beginning. Lech is a typical Pole, a master of improvisation. A hobby inventor who often loses track of time while working in his workshop in Gdansk. His latest invention is this boat, driven by plane propellers. He's not sure yet quite how this will function, but he's currently working on that. The passion for the sea has had an impact on his life very early on. For 30 years, Lech worked as an underwater archaeologist in Gdansk. I have been interested in photography since my time at grammar school in Shitno. Even back then I wanted to capture the beauty of nature underwater by taking pictures. And that is how I discovered my passion for diving. During the socialist era in Poland, film equipment was difficult to come by, even for his work. Lech kept building the devices himself. His handmade camera still works today and served him well during his excavations. As long as his health allows, Lechnovich will still go diving. He couldn't imagine life without the Baltic Sea. Lech knows every nook and cranny of the wrecks in the Gulf of Gdansk. He still prepares for each dive with the same meticulous care. It doesn't matter if you are 30 or 79, a mistake can be lethal. Okay, just go okay. Ja cię trzymam. Okej, okay, puść.
Lech finds the Vicar interesting because it used to be a steamship. There is still a lot to see. Drives, containers and the steam generator, which give an indication of the construction type. It is hard to say what fascinates me about Rex, but as a professional you get enthusiastic about every little piece that is retrieved. Beneath every one of them there could be an object of interest that would extend the museum's collection. Once I dived to the wreck of the Solin to retrieve stones. While down there, I suddenly realized that I wasn't holding a stone in my hand. It was much too light for a stone. And indeed, when I pulled it out, I saw that it was a skull. I almost felt as though I had disturbed someone's eternal rest there. I felt very queasy at that moment. The shipyard of Gdansk, founded in 1844, is at the western mouth of the Vistula. In the summer of 1980, the shipyard became internationally known thanks to the founding of the Solidarność Union, which initiated strikes all across Poland. Until today, the shipyard is considered the birthplace of democratic Poland. After the privatisation of the shipyard in the early 90s, the staff was reduced from 15,000 employees to 3,000. Instead of the welders, came artists. From 2001, they were allowed to set up their studios on the shipyard grounds. One of these artists is photographer Michał Schlager. I've been on this shipyard for 10 years now. During this time my skills as a photographer have steadily increased. When I had a better feeling for the place, I began taking pictures of the people. It was important to me that the workers looked as honorable as possible. I am always on the lookout for interesting faces. the workers used to be colleagues. Michał funded his photography studies by working as a welder. These days he's more likely to come across artists than oil-covered shipyard workers. At first it was a big surprise that you could move here along with other well-known artists while we were all still at college. For a few years it was a very comfortable place where we could evolve in the surroundings of the shipyard, its ruins and the still employed workers. The shipyard changes its face almost daily. Building ships brings almost no money anymore. Investors want to build a shopping centre on the premises. The old submarine hall. Michal's favourite place. He knows it inside out and regards the decay of this industrial landmark with great sadness. He wants to preserve it, at least visually, for the next generations. My primary intention is to document everything that disappears. Somehow no one else had the idea of such a project. And at some point my work had progressed so far that there was no turning back, and I didn't want to. 
jest tak zaawansowana, że jeżeli... It would be awful if the story wasn't told. For people of my generation, the shipyard symbolizes something that has gone. A no wiesz, jest symbolem czegoś, co się skończyło. Michał Schlager made a name for himself way beyond Gdansk. He takes pictures for glossy magazines and newspapers all over Poland. In his eyes, the chapter Shipyard of Gdansk is far from being closed. Work at the shipyard is often very exhausting, but I love it. The realization of my shipyard project consumes a lot of time and energy. When I first started here, I thought about staying five years. These five years have become ten. I think I'll need another ten years to finish the project. From Gdansk, we travel across the Hill Peninsula to Weber. Sopot, seaside resort for the people of Gdansk. The town owes its rise as a chic health resort to Napoleon's personal doctor, who invested his fortune here. The southern tip of the Hale Peninsula juts out 35 kilometers into the Baltic Sea and forms a boundary between the Gulf of Gdansk and the open sea. The Seagull Reef is a sandbank that stretches for several kilometers and is a select breeding ground for cormorants. At the sea-facing side of the Hale Peninsula, you can be lucky enough to spot the last of an endangered species, harbour porpoises. The oceanographer Krzysztof Skura tries to understand their language and analyses their behaviour with modern recording devices. In the eastern Baltic Sea, there are only 100 harbour porpoises left. Each year, more animals die than are born. For Krzysztof Skura, they are fascinating animals that should be protected. The shape of harbour porpoises is perfect. When you touch one, you can see nature's perfection. Its body is perfect for the water. It is an animal that is not capable of showing aggression towards humans. It is always smiling. It is calm and silent. You could say it is the gentleman of the Baltic Sea. Krzysztof Skura was one of the first students of marine biology at the University of Gdansk. Today he teaches the subject. He wants to convey to his students a connection to nature and animals. He felt this connection already as a child. Harbour porpoises have their favourite places, also in the bay. Researchers laid out listening devices in different places in the sea there, so that they could eavesdrop on the marine mammals. Based on these recorded sound waves, they can determine how many animals are residing in the region at any one time. The harbour porpoises speak at a frequency that humans can't hear. Our machines record the noises, the computer edits them in the laboratory and displays them on a graph with other noises. That's how we can distinguish harbour porpoise sounds from other underwater sounds. 
dźwięk morfina od innych dźwięków, które są pod, wo- pod wodą. The clicks of the porpoises are nothing more than sound waves that they emit in order to explore their surroundings with a sonar. So they kind of see with their ears. Their biggest enemy is the fishing industry. Harbour porpoises have a remarkably good sense of location, so the researchers can't explain why they can't identify fish nets as something dangerous. An answer to this question could ensure the survival of this animal species. Porpoises are mammals. They breathe like humans do and have to come up to the water's surface for air. When they get caught in the net, they suffocate underwater. So a device was invented that was called the whale shoer. We built a sonic fence between Hell and Gdynia so that the bay is divided and the animals are warned. A hydroacoustic device that produces signals. An underwater horn that warns the animals of nets in front of them. A small step towards saving the harbour porpoises. Krzysztof Skura knows that a lot has to be done in order to save the animals of the Baltic Sea. You have to understand how the ecosystem works. If we don't grasp that quickly enough, we will lose the sea. The Baltic Sea doesn't only have to be clean, but also fertile. Fertile for humans and every animal that lives here. Harbour porpoises, birds and fish. Krzysztof Skura constantly starts new projects to protect nature and increase the populations of endangered species. Almost all Poles are away on holiday from the middle of July till the end of August. 38 million. Most of them like to spend the summer on their own coast. In the heavily vegetated forest, Stilo Lighthouse sits enthroned. Almost a thousand meters away from the coast of the Baltic Sea. Veronika Ujitska has worked here for the past 20 years. A shift is 12 hours long and she earns 470 euros a month. Even today, she can't get enough of looking at the ships and the Baltic coast. The lighthouse is always a bit different depending on which season it is. Just like a person changes, so does a lighthouse. I think I can compare the lighthouse to myself. It's big and shines from the inside out. Veronica lives only a few kilometers away from her workplace. She enjoys working night shifts. Then she has a bit of peace and quiet. My father-in-law and my husband decided that the family tradition should be carried on. They wanted me to work here as well. It's good when a lighthouse is in family hands, but for that you also need a woman. What is no longer financially feasible in many other countries is part of a tradition in Poland. Along the entire coast, each lighthouse has its own keeper. I think I'm one of those people who are completely committed to their work. And I'm a lighthouse keeper with all my heart. Not like people who want to work in a lighthouse part-time. 
Ja uważam, że musi być to mocny charakter, żeby wytrzymać tam siedząc dwa dni. You have to have a strong character if you want to endure more than two days here. You have to be capable of withdrawing from people and your own problems. Tam będąc samemu, to musi być mocny charakter. So that the family tradition is carried on. Veronica has high hopes in her grandson Alexander. He already knows what he wants to be one day. A lighthouse keeper just like his grandmother. I am very proud that my grandson wants to follow in my footsteps as lighthouse keeper here and that Alexander will carry on the family tradition. Alexander said that he knew immediately that he wanted to become a lighthouse keeper when he first witnessed the blue hours as the lighthouse started to shine and he was thrilled by how beautiful the tower shone at night. Only few can enjoy this experience. At nightfall, the beacon fire of Stilo flares up and the light streaks the dark water. Then the forests wake up to their second life. Some 4,000 wild wolves inhabit Poland's forests. Most of them live in the Carpathians. The packs rarely venture as far as the coast. From Weber, we go via Ustka to Rusovo. The waves of the Baltic Sea push sand to the coast, where it builds up in small mounds. The wind carries the fine grains inland. Each year, this dune landscape grows 3 to 10 meters. That is how the Polish Sahara, as the meanwhile 50 meter high dune world near Weber is called, was formed. Natasha Tsaban accomplished something of which others can only dream and would never even dare attempt. When she was 30 years old, she got in her sailing boat and took off all by herself. She sailed all around the world. For me, the Baltic Sea has its own and specific smell and taste. I looked for it on the Indian Ocean and the Pacific but I found it nowhere else. That is why I always have to come back and dip my feet into the Baltic Sea. My lonely journey around the globe took over two years. I learned that the world is full of good people and that it is not as big as we always think it is. I also discovered who I really am. That was an important experience. I will never regret this journey. I eat some. Two years at sea brought the circumnavigator many experiences that others don't have in their entire lives. Deprivation, loneliness, fear of death. After everything she endured at sea, there isn't much on the shore that Natasha fears to do anymore. When she was 22 years old, she already dreamt about sailing around the world. But only after another eight years, when she was 30, was she able to afford her dream. I learned from the best. I knew that if I was alone on the ocean, I needed to be able to help myself. And I tried to live with the fear. Today I know that you can do much more than you think you can. Natasha's big sister taught her how to sail. At first on a lake near Weber. That was less dangerous. But the open sea interested her more.
Why sail across the globe? Because that is the biggest challenge a sailor can imagine. I like challenges. It's in my blood. The Baltic Sea is a very strict teacher. It is a difficult area for sailing, but it's also one where it's worth learning and you can really fine-tune your sailing technique. Natasha wants to help children develop a dream and give them the courage to realize it. Just like she once had a dream and worked on realizing it year by year. I really hope that someone here in Uska will follow in my footsteps. From my biography, the children will learn that the world is their oyster and that Uska is a window to the world, just as it was for me. Natasha is a woman full of longing. Faraway shores are as big an attraction to her as her local beach. She has the Baltic Sea to thank for that where she had the time to find her way as a child, year after year. Ten kilometers from the coast is the checkered land. It has the many checkered facades to thank for its name. Nowhere in Poland can you find more timber framework. Not far from the coast in Roosevelt is an old farm which Anna Britzen and her German husband bought in 2001. The German-Polish couple set up a guest house with a golf course on their farm and now earn their money by taking in tourists. Included in the price, not just holiday accommodation, but also homemade schnapps. To make good schnapps, you need lots of time, and it is a lot of work. You have to put your heart in it. When I distill schnapps and liqueur, I put a lot of love and care into it. I want it to be tasty and good. It's supposed to be a treat for the people. Anna Britzen has returned to Rusovo, the place of her childhood memories. I live in Rusovo because I associate my nicest summer holidays with this place. My grandmother is from Ostronia Moskje and her best friend owned a farm here. Each year I came here for my summer break and spent a wonderful month in the countryside with milk from the farm and fresh eggs. I returned here for sentimental reasons. Anna is from East Poland. For many years she and her husband lived in Germany. After their return, they had to acclimatize again to life in the country. Out of season, the couple doesn't have many guests, and so they are not very busy with the guest house. They needed a hobby. In the beginning, I had no idea how to do it. That's not surprising, from life in the city to the complete opposite life in the country. And we had so much fruit, apples, plums. We didn't know what to do with all of it. So my husband Volker simply started distilling it. The chopped apples are put into large bottles with water, yeast and sugar. After a few weeks you have mash, a basic element for distilling schnapps. In a copper kettle, the apple mash gets heated just above the boiling temperature of alcohol.
steam rises up. It is absorbed in a pipe that leads it into a cooling coil. There, the distillate condenses and drips as schnapps into a container. First of all, I needed recipes in order to know how much fruit, yeast and sugar were necessary. Now, I simply do it the trial and error way. I test taste, colour and smell. Those are the most important things I go by. The Poles normally drink five and a half litres of schnapps each year. That is the European average. Anna Britzen's special schnapps would probably even increase the schnapps consumption in Europe if everybody knew about it. Coming from the Baltic Sea, we follow the right arm of the River Oder to the German-Polish border to Czechin. After the end of socialism in Poland, the city presented itself as a young metropolis. Out of 400,000 citizens, every seventh is a student. The castle of the Pomeranian Dukes is the city's historic core and also its cultural center with opera and theater. The hinterland of the coast provides fertile ground for the cultivation of potatoes. Most potatoes on the European market come from Pomerania. Poland was, and still is, a land of horse breeders. For 400 years now, noble warmbloods have come from the stud farm in Nowy Elitze. For two generations, it has been run by one family, the Bobiks. Jan Bobik is very ambitious. He wants to follow in his father's footsteps and also become a successful breeder and show jumper. Jan is already well on the way to becoming Polish champion. I first started riding in my summer holidays 12 years ago. I was seven years old back then, when a friend came to visit us. I was very jealous because my father coached him. One day my father set me on the back of a horse and saw that it worked quite well. Horses dominate his everyday life. He starts his day by feeding them and marking out their stables. In addition to that, there is the daily practice with his father. It pays off. Jan has been Polish junior vice champion twice already. Wanting to win is in the Bobik's blood. Jan's dad won silver at the Olympics in Moscow in 1980. Now he teaches his son the tricks of the trade. My favorite horse is called Chara and is 16 years old. I learned most of what I know about riding from her. I won all big tournaments that take place in Poland with her. She taught me all the important things you have to know about equestrian sports and never expected too much from me. I owe it to her that I can ride so well. Chara and Jan have spent almost their entire lives together, but she'll only accompany him to a few more contests before retiring as a brood mare. Bobbick's horses are Hanoverians. They are known as good show jumpers. 
Jan's grandfather brought the Hanoverians to the stud farm in the 50s. Back then, it was still a public enterprise. Chara was once his teacher. Now Jan is ready to go to loan. My goals are the biggest horse shows. I want to win the Olympics and the World and European Championships. 